All right, welcome to today's video about Macbeth. Today we will be covering Act Four, Scenes One through Three. Uh, you have the optional Khan Academy, and your discussion board number two is due. All right. So in Act Four, Scene One, the horror of the witches is, is reasserted through chance, uh, rhyming couplets, without a fallacy, and a sense of communion with animals and familiars. Just as they were presented in Act One, Scene One, uh, an additional horror is represented through the creation of the spell and the cauldron's contents. For example, a toad that has been sweating poison for thirty-one days. Uh, the second witch conveys this passage here: the horror conveyed through audience witnessing the witches produce the series of body parts, initially those of animals. The ingredients ascend the supernatural creatures before the horror of human body parts, culminating in the highly deserving, disturbing extent description of a finger, a baby strangled by a prostitute, and the disc of which the baby was born. The baby will be damned as a result of not being baptized, as would the Jew, Turk, and Tartar of the preceding lines. Okay, so this is the famous chant, double, double toil and trouble, fire burn and cauldron bubble. The choral chant is a spell designed to double the suffering in the world. The use of internal rhyme, double and trouble, as well as the repetition of double, complement the sense of excess being sought by the witches. So in this scene, the witches as the embodiment of evil illustrate the extent of Beth's evil, given that they refer to the Beth as such. He is dehumanized as something. So the Beth's recklessness and self-interest is evident. He is abusive to the witches and commands them to answer them whatever the consequences till the shuffling sicken. The masters refer to the evil spirits that control the witches. These subsequently take the form of apparitions. So this is our possible first symbol of Beth, whose head is later cut off by Macduff. Uh, you see thunder, first apparition, and an armed head. <clears throat> The bloody child may represent Macduff here, who was from his mother's womb and untimely ripped. Note that the witches foreshadow the play's conclusion by stating that the second is more potent than the first. The best initial response echoes to earlier, if chance will have me king, why chance may crown me without my stir. However, he rejects this in his next line, asserting that he will have to make sure to doubly sure by killing Macduff. Okay, so that's a little bit of a foreshadowing there as well. Um, Beth believes that killing Maduff will allow him to return to a state where he can sleep free from doubts and fears. Okay, so the child in this scene may represent the young Malcolm, the tree symbolizing the carrying of the trees from burning wood to Dunsany. Note the manipulation of the witches promoting and unthinking of Beth in this scene below. Okay, in this scene here, the glass mirror could have been used as a dramatic device to show that the ankle stretches on indefinitely. It could even have been used to reflect the image of James I in the first production, representing the claim that James believed himself to be a descendant of Banco. Remember, we talked about that in class. A possible reference to the two coronations of James I in the title of James I, King of England, Scotland, and France. So the eight kings could represent the eight steward kings of Scotland. Okay, when I, the irony that Lennox is the scene, being that the Lord, he has accompanied the Beth, the irony is evident to the audience given the way Shakespeare has juxtaposition, juxtaposition, the scene in which Lennox criticizes the Beth with this, in which she is the sole companion of the Beth. The Beth is shown to have no one on who he can rely. It is deeply ironic that the Beth is damning himself given his belief in the witches. So in this scene, parallelism conveys a strong link between emotion and action. As soon as he wishes, or as soon as he feels he wishes to do something, he will do it. Termination is evident in the list of those he will now kill that immediately follows. So the, the purpose cool, Macbeth reflects on the need for action rather than procrastination, appealing at one scene seven. Words to the heat of deeds, too cold breath, breath gives, and at three scene four must be acted here they may be scanned. Okay, so moving on to Act 4, Scene 2. This is our little bit of a plot summary. The best third crime is to pit them on stage, and its horror is made even more shocking by allowing the audience to engage in Macduff's son and wife before the murder. Macduff's son displays humility, bravery, and wit, exploring the metaphor of him as a bird by stating that he will survive on what he can get 
and then he need not fear being trapped because he is too skinny. Four birds they are not set for. So in this scene, the parallelism reinforces the illusion to fair is fail and fail is fair. Lady Macduff recognizes that this is a wicked world. Here, another example of Macduff's son's bravery as he defends his father's honor. The reference to fish eggs emphasizes how young the boy is, making his murder still more terrible. So the boy's thoughts are for his mother, not for himself. A contrast to Macbeth in the previous scene, lines 50 to 60. Okay, moving on to Act 4, Scene 3, at one fell swoop. So Malcolm is suspicious of Macduff, given Macduff has just arrived in England from Scotland. Macduff wishes to act, using the image of Scotland as a wounded comrade to be defended. The list of horrors makes the suffering of the Scots appear endless, and the parallelism of the clauses gives a sense of in inevitability. So here there's some dramatic irony given the audience has just witnessed the destruction of Macduff's family. Malcolm is clear to Macduff that he does not trust him and he believes possible that Macduff could be prepared to offer him the weak poor innocent lamb to the death and angry God. Macduff's simple sentence conveys his certainty. I am not treacherous. Okay, the good and the virtuous, virtuous emphasizes that even the most positive natures could be com compromised by the imperial charge, the orders from the king. The theme of deception is explored further through a consideration of Lucifer, the highest, brightest angel who fell to wage war on God and become the devil. The implication is that Macduff could have appeared good in the past but became evil now. So Macduff despairs that it seems that the goodness cannot stop tyranny. Malcolm resents Scotland to illustrate its suffering. In a second attempt to test Macduff, Malcolm claims that he would be worse than Macbeth. So in this scene, the black is used to represent the best evil nature, and Malcolm proclaimed evil is said to be so bad that it would make Macbeth appear pure as snow. Malcolm uses the land simile once again, but this time to describe the country's perception of Macbeth in comparison to his future self. And below, the field of hell is used to show Macbeth's cruelty. He does not believe that anyone can be worse than Macbeth. So the list of negative adjectives above described to Macbeth recognizes horror. And below, Mac Malcolm, however, claims to be worse, having no limit to his lust. He will have any woman, young or old, and he will not be satisfied. So Macduff criticizes Malcolm's lack of virtue. Macduff suggests that Malcolm could satisfy his desires while appearing chaste, as there will be sufficient women willing to sleep with the king. Worth noting that even Macduff is prepared to deceive, advocating that Malcolm essentially looks like the innocent flower in order to avoid the greater evil of Macbeth. And then the vulture below is, conveys the indiscriminate desire of someone leecherous given that their virtue as a carrion bird would eat anything. Macduff's point is that Malcolm can't be worse, so that he can consume all those who be prepared to sleep with the king. In addition, there's a lot of notes of unstoppable greed. The simile of sauce below suggests that Malcolm, having tasted the wealth of others, would just become hungry for more. It's like eating chocolate, one chocolate, only one. So Macduff is not happy. Uh, previous King of Scotland hath been the sword of our slain kings. Macduff claims that he has enough resources that will belong to the king to satisfy, satisfy Malcolm's appetites. Okay, the list above the qualities required of the king, despite the seemingly endless list of such qualities, Malcolm denies that he has any of them. Reminiscent of the best demand for answers from hell's sources in Act 4, Scene 1, in which he is prepared to sacrifice universal order to serve his needs till destruction sicken. But Duff cannot accept the kind of man Malcolm describes himself as being, thereby revealing his honesty. So below, not entitled tyrant, whose kinship represented was achieved through bloodshed. The Malcolm explained that he lied to Macduff about his vices in order to test his loyalty. He now states that he is the opposite of what he said previously, and in his earlier words represented the first lie he has ever told. They also linked Macbeth to hell in the sea. So Edward the Confessor is referenced again as a contrast to devilish Macbeth. The king has a divine touch, a God-given gift that grants him the power to heal. So again, this is that comparison between England and Scotland, being that the king is holy. The horror of life in Scotland are the best rules described. The only ones who smile are those who know nothing. People die frequently and quickly. 
So in this scene, Ross is reluctant to tell Maduff about the murder of his family. The fun on at peace acts as a euphemism for the dead. Ross wishes Malcolm to lead an army north, something that Maduff has been seeking. He may not have wanted to disclose the news of, of, of Maduff's family's murder until he learns that Malcolm has persuaded we are coming. Now that Malcolm's support is assured, all euphemism is removed. There is an emotive verb that is, that is modified by an adverb to render it even more horrific. They say that he savagely slaughtered the family. Like deer, the image of a pile of hunted deer conveys the helplessness in the duck's family. Note the fun of deer and deer. So the duck's inability to accept the murder generates sympathy for his character. Macbeth is described once again as a creature of hell. This time he is described as a kite, part of prey, killing the duck's chickens in one fell swoop. The image captures the defenseless nature of the duck's family and the ruthlessness of Macbeth. So Macbeth is going from our protagonist to our antagonist. So Macbeth blames himself for his family's murders. Heaven did not inter intercede because of his sins. His self deprecation is in stark contrast to Macbeth's hubris and act thought. And finally, Keen of Scotland is another hellish metaphor for Macbeth. Okay, so that pretty much ends where we're going today with our summary and quotes. Let's go over our worksheets. Okay, so in Act, 16, Act uh, 3, Scene 5, sorry, the question is why is Hecate, the goddess of witchcraft, upset with the witches? She is upset that the witches spoke to Macbeth without her consent. Okay, let's move on to Scene 6. You can, remember, we can skip all the drawing questions. Number 19, based on this monologue, what is on Lennox's mind? He is thinking about all the murders that have happened. He is trying to figure out if Macbeth is indeed a murderer. And number 20, what... Which people does the Lord say will probably be helpers to Miss Malcolm and the stuff in England? And he says King Edward and Seward. Okay, and right here. What is most likely the reason that Macduff has traveled to England to join Malcolm? He wants to stop Macbeth. Alright, so we'll go over ask four questions tomorrow. Uh, I'm sorry, we'll go over it next week. Tomorrow is the critical thinking lesson. So we'll meet tomorrow at 1230 on Zoom. Thanks again.